serious note, you guys are in for a treat today. Um, I, we have the great fortune of having Dr. Chalfant here. Dr. Chalfant is one of the, um, probably one of the, the best, uh, one of the most exciting lipid bio, uh, biochemists and lipidomics people um, in the country right now. Um, you guys, many of you remember when Dr. Murphy came to give the Morris Lecture. So this is a younger version of Dr. Murphy, um, <laughs> to say the least. So Dr. Chalfant actually got his undergrad degree at the University of Tampa, went on and got his PhD at the University of South Florida, um, then um, started a, a, PH, a, a, a postdoctoral fellowship with Yusuf Hunnam, a very famous a person in lipid signaling, where he went uh, from Duke to Medical University of South Carolina, where uh, Dr. Chalfant then joined the faculty and then was recruited to Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU, where he was there and, as they say, rose through the ranks and became professor and vice chair. And, for the, and about three years ago, was recruited to University of South Florida, where he holds the Wood Chair in Natural Science. And he is a professor and chair of the Department of, imagine this, Cell biology, microbiology, and molecular biology. Uh, he also uh, has a uh, GS-15 um, through the VA, which is the highest rank that you can get. And I'm, I'm, I have been involved in these panels where they discuss the people who are applying for GS-15 status, and it really is a superstar. And so we really are quite fortunate to have a superstar amongst us because it's a very competitive and very few people are, are actually picked to be the top of the food chain. Um, he has uh, multiple NIH and VA grants, has over 100 peer-reviewed publications, um, and today he's going to be talking about his work on ceramides and wound healing. So please give a right raider. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I don't know whether any of that's deserved in any way, shape, or form. I just bribe people extremely well, okay, to get anywhere. So, uh, but it is my pleasure to be here today. Uh, I do stem here. I just call it CMMB. Uh, like Jeff said, I, I don't even say the whole name. They just obviously, when they named the department, they couldn't come up with a consensus as to what they wanted. So we just call it CMMB where I'm at. And today it's really a pleasure to be here and talk a little bit about wound healing and how maybe this lipid protein interaction may be involved. Can everybody hear me pretty well in the back? It's all good? All right. I don't have any idea what screen. Do you guys have a preference which screen? I've actually never done a tri-screen before, funny enough. So anybody got a preference? If not, I'll probably just bounce around to whatever my eye hits, you know, just kind of keep you guys, you know, focused on the talk as we go through. Uh, I do hail from Tampa. This is my department here for at least half of them that would show up for the departmental picture, which is good. Um, I'm a VA scientist. I'm also part of the, the Moffitt Cancer Center as well. And this is kind of our new building, the newest building at USF that we happen to be lucky enough to be housed in. And so again, I always like to make sure I remember to, to thank Jeff for your invitation. Thank you very much. Here's what happens when you do something at the beach. The entire department will then actually show up and not just for the <laughs> departmental picture, only half of them. All right, so here's kind of the outline of the seminar I'm going to talk about today. So. Uh, some of you may be interested in lipids, some of you may say, really, lipids? I really just try to avoid them in my diet, which is probably not a bad thing for the most part. So at least I'll give you a little trivia and some historical background and some Greek mythology up front. So you'll get something out of this, you go on to Jeopardy, you're going to be ready to go if you get a question about Oedipus or anything or the Sphinx. Then we're going to talk a quick background on the enzymes and the uh, lipid I'm going to talk about today, CPLA2-alpha and ceramide-1-phosphate. I'm going to go quickly over the last decade examining the role of ceramide 1-phosphate in a cosinoid biosynthesis, and then focus toward the last half of the talk on the unpublished findings in wound healing, which is kind of a new area uh, for us. And if I have time, we can wrap up and talk about where we're going and what we call the switching function hypothesis in the laboratory. So starting off here, uh, how many of you guys are familiar with sphingolipids at all? I got two, three, four, that's about all I get. And then Four people never want to raise their hands, so about eight of you <laughs> probably have some, some kind of knowledge of sphingolipids. Uh, so I've been working in the field in my postdoc in this, and I've even actually read this guy's book here. So Thudicum uh, actually reported in 1884 the existence of sphingolipids. Uh, he called them sphingolipids, or sphingosine is first compound because of its enigmatic nature. 
And he did this, and it's not based on the Egyptian Sphinx. Uh, if you guys were to run into Yusuf Hanoun, he's my former mentor. He's the Cancer Center Director up at SUNY. Uh, let him know I turned him into something. What I normally do is just turning him into something weird every time I give a talk uh, at this point. But he's not Yoda this time, he's just the Egyptian Sphinx. But Sphingo actually goes with ancient Greek and it actually goes with Greek mythology or the Greek Sphinx. And I always like to, to, to start off with this because it's a very interesting coincidence uh, in historical coincidence. So Thutakum in 1884 named them Sphingolipids uh, based on its enigmatic nature because the story of Oedipus is in Greek mythology as you come across the Sphinx while you're traveling. The Sphinx asks you a riddle uh, and usually you do not answer it correctly. The Sphinx then actually kills you. And so Sphingo actually means to strangle in ancient Greek. So what's interesting about that is that exactly 100 years after Sphingolipids were first discovered, uh, Yusuf Hanoun reported that the function for Sphingolipids or coming up with or answering the riddle for sphingolipids as to what the biological function was, in this case ceramide, one of the base sphingolipids we have here, uh, actually induces apoptosis or cell suicide. What's interesting about that is that the sphinx, the Greek sphinx, when you answer the riddle, was so distraught, actually threw themselves off the cliff onto the rocks and committed suicide. So it's kind of very interesting how they were named and what the actual biological function was. I thought that was a very interesting historical coincidence uh, when I started looking into it. Today, we're gonna really be talking about another, what sphingain means in ancient Greek, which means to bind tightly, which goes to that sphinx actually binding your neck tightly and strangling you. In this case, I'm gonna really talk about how this sphingolipid, ceramide 1-phosphate, this lipid, actually binds tightly to C2, C2 domains, or in this case, the C2 domain of CPLA2-alpha, which is one of the enzymes. So there, you guys are now ready for some Greek mythology if you ever get on Jeopardy or anything, right? You ready, Jeff, you got that? Got All right, good to go. So you know a little bit of ancient Greek words as well. So you got something out of the talk already. Now you can go to sleep if you're not interested in lipids whatsoever at this point, okay? So now we'll go to the quick background, uh, I'm sorry, on the enzymes. So one of the enzymes we're gonna talk about today is cytosolic phospholipase A2. It's also group 4A phospholipase A2. You may have seen it in that. It's an 85 kilodalton protein. You can see it's probably very highly regulated. It's got this calcium lipid binding domain or C2 domain, which is what we are gonna talk about ceramide 1-phosphate binding tightly to today in the first part of the talk. Uh, it will bind calcium, that's what these little blips here are. Uh, that will allow it then to blanch the charge and hydrophobically insert to PC-rich membranes. It's also regulated by PIP2. That'll be something I'll talk about later at the, at the end if I have time. Uh, and it's also highly phosphorylated, which is also many of these are required for its catalytic activity by a number of enzymes like the MAP kinase pathway activated by cytokines. And what this enzyme essentially does upon activation is cleave at the SN2 position. You guys, well, you're pharmacologists. You guys should really appreciate organic chemistry. So you guys are probably really into this. Most of the time I give this talk to cell biologists and they don't want to see anything that looks like organic chemistry in any way, shape, or form. But in this case, we can, you guys will love this. So at the SN2 position, PLA2 will cleave here and release this acyl-CoA, which can go on to actually uh, produce a cosinoids, which I have on the next slide. And that's simply what this enzyme does. And when it does that, and a lot of people don't even realize that the initial rate limiting step in prostaglandins or cosinoid synthesis is actually activation of a PLA2, not the secondary. You guys familiar at all with the cosinoid pathways, prostaglandins, hands? It's like the same hands for sphingolipids. Is that the only people that have, like lipids at all? Okay. So, uh, but all of you actually love this pathway. How many people have taken ibuprofen? Yes, come on, I take ibuprofen all the time. Um, uh, aspirin, one of the longest running therapeutics, aspirin. This is what targets, but it doesn't target the initial rate limiting step like most drugs do, like the statins that tar target HM-CoA reductase. Uh, it actually targets the, to the COX enzymes, which are a secondary rate limiting step of the assay, especially for COX-2, because COX-2 would be upregulated with certain cytokines, and that's one of the rate limiting steps if you don't get that. But really, the initial rate limiting step is activation of PLA-2. So CPLA-2-alpha will be activated by cytokines, growth factors, mechanical trauma, translocate to membranes, where it then will cleave at an SN2 position again, cleaving off things like arachidonic acid. It will also uh, cleave off the DHA if it's there, EPA as well. These will then be used by the various synthases, the COX, and then depending on the other synthases that are in the cell or the cell type, 
you'll make various types of other eicosanoids, in this case prostaglandins, that do all of these biology. So it's a billion dollar industry uh, in, in uh, the uh, sectors, the drug sectors, in order to look at this and modulate this pathway. So other thing I want you to appreciate for the talk today is that uh, although you take ibuprofen because you're on fire, you're not feeling well, these kind of things, there's also lipids that are very good, make you nice and calm and relaxed and are more pro-resolution as well. So kind of appreciate that. They're just not pro-inflammatory or bad. And then the enzyme we're gonna talk about today, or at least the product, is uh, ceramide 1-phosphate. Again, this is a sphingolipid. One of the base molecules that I talked about before is ceramide. It looks a lot like diacylglycerol. Everybody know diacylglycerol and protein kinase C, or you just don't want to remember your basic biochemistry. I think that's been in the, the, the book for a while. So this is a sphingolipid that's analogous, except it's got a very more, a more complex backbone here, a sphingoid backbone, but still double acylated chain. This is a second messenger will bind to phosphatases and induce apoptosis. Well, if it gets converted in mammalian cells, and the only enzyme we know in mammalian cells to actually convert ceramide to ceramide 1-phosphate is ceramide kinase. It's actually first, the activity was first described by Sandy Bahala, who's still at the University of Washington. And she described the activity of converting this by phosphorylation on the one position to make ceramide 1-phosphate. Very similar to phosphatidic acid would be the analogous glycerol lipid in this case. All right, so let's now, we've got a little background there on these enzymes. We'll talk about our last decade examining the possible role for ceramide 1-phosphate in eicosanoid biosynthesis. All right, so I always like to start with this. How many are students and postdocs here? None of you are students or postdocs? It's all faculty? It's all faculty? <laughs> wow, I don't remember being that young. <laughs> Well, maybe there's one or two students or postdocs in here then. Okay, <laughs> who wants to raise their hand? Uh, I like to start out with how we even form the hypothesis to look at this. And some of this is gonna date me and some of the older faculty are gonna enjoy this. So do you guys even remember the red, big red, red Sigma book? Have you come across it, you know, cleaning out an old lab at this point? Um, I like to tell this story because never just, if something sticks in your mind, don't be afraid to bring it up to your mentor and don't be afraid to just kind of see where it goes. Because this entire story of the entire thing I'm going to talk about today stemmed from that ridiculous Sigma catalog that's now online. In a sphingolipid laboratory, sphingolipid laboratory, we usually uh, order sphingomyelin AC and it's a way of generating ceramide in the membrane of cells to look at ceramide function, which was the major focus of the lab I was in for the postdoc. During that, when I was looking to order it, right next to it was sphingomyelinase D. This is why, Jeff, I know so much about this bloody spider and its venom. And so I kept saying, sphingomyelinase D? Why in the world are they selling sphingomyelinase D? And they only sold it for one year at Sigma, and I happened to look at the, the catalog at the time. And right at the same time, I had seen a group meeting in our laboratory thinking, looking at calcium stimulation regulating eicosanoid synthesis as one of our group meetings. And the only calcium stimulated enzyme in sphingolipids is ceramide kinase, the enzyme I just talked about. And so you take two and two together, sphingomyelinase D simply converts sphingomyelin to ceramide 1-phosphate. We don't have a mammalian version that we know of at this time, but that's essentially the main component of this venom. And at the same time, this main component gives the same pathophysiology here when you get bit by a spider, intense inflammatory response and are mediated by arachidonic acid and prostaglandins that you would get from snake venom which many of them, or snake venom or bee venom, have some kind of PLA, like a PLA2. And that's how they actually do it to drive the same kind of response is they actually have a PLA2 that goes in and hijacks and cleaves the membranes and then drives the eicosanoid pathway to give this intense response. This venom, though, doesn't have any kind of PLA. It actually just converts single myelin to ceramide 1-phosphate. And so we came up with a hypothesis that maybe ceramide 1-phosphate was an inflammatory molecule especially since the enzyme is, that makes it in mammalian cells is calcium stimulated, and calcium is very important for many of the inflammatory agonists uh, that cells respond to. And we did a very simple experiment then, so don't, again, don't be afraid. Go to Jeff and say, I wanna try this. He's not gonna think you're completely crazy, maybe a little bit at first. And if it's cheap, he's gonna say yes. If it's cheap and it doesn't take much of your time, he's gonna say yes, I guarantee you. Well, cheap, not much time. Those are the two key factors to get something with your mentor and go to a new, new area. And so this was cheap. We already had the assay going, looking at arachidonic acid release in the laboratory. And all I simply had to do was take the cells and I could put on the, uh, the lipids 
and look to see the arachidonic acid release by putting on the lipids. So here just looking at a, a dose concentration, we found a ceramide one phosphate in an animal range gave a very strong uh, induction of arachidonic acid release from cells and closely related lipids, ceramide and phosphatidic acid didn't really have an effect until you started getting to the micromolar range. And the ceramide effect here that's going up, we actually attributed to later, if you took out ceramide kinase, you actually couldn't get this, this little blip occurring with ceramide. That was due to ceramide being converted over to ceramide 1-phosphate. So we also found this was time dependent and again, lipid specific. So again, just to remind you, the, the only enzyme in mammalian cells that we know today that the way to make ceramide 1-phosphate is through ceramide kinase. And so the next step was to simply ask the question, because we're not really venom biologists uh, at this point, we want to know whether this has anything, any relevance whatsoever to do to mammalian cells. And this is kind of dating. Anybody remember the old way to do siRNA back in the day? It was very expensive. You had to get it from the German company. You couldn't get it from uh, like Darmacon or anything like that. So very expensive. You could only usually buy one. There's only one way to design it. And so the way you looked at specificity there was to do a dose response for siRNA. And so that's why you're saying, why is he doing a dose response? Usually you just get a couple different sequences. Well, the way in the old days we showed specificity was to get a IC50 of about 20 to 25 nanomolar, and that was showing specificity for your target at that time. And so I know this is a little bit busy slide here, and I'll just kind of run you through it. So the inflammatory agonist we're using is IL-1 beta. It's an inflammatory cytokine, and we're treating our cells here for about four hours or so to give a nice, robust response. We're reading out PG2 uh, release here. The only way we could do it back in the day before lipidomics was with an ELISA kit, but this is probably one of the more specific antibodies they have uh, for the eicosanoids. And so down here is the basal. The control in ceramide kinase siRNA over this dose of siRNA had really no effect on the basal PG2 release in these cells. This is the response here over the dose here with control siRNA and IL-1 beta. So this is our expectation. We should have this kind of robust increase in PGE2 release. And so what you can see is that ceramide kinase siRNA over time, over the dose, has a very strong inhibition. And then when we finally had an antibody to this over here, we showed that we were definitely getting very specific knockdown of ceramide kinase as well. And of course, we've done this with multiple sequences as well since this time. So indeed, it looked like ceramide 1-phosphate was actually playing a role in a cosinoid synthesis with real inflammatory agonists with mammalian cells. And so then we go, what is the direct target? I've kind of given that away with the title of the talk. At the time, it was special to us because we didn't know what the target was. And there are a number of PLA2s to look at. But one of the main ones that really jumped out as to us was CPLA2-alpha. It's got a calcium lipid binding domain, so it may actually be interacting with it. And so to actually test that, I went to Wamwa Cho, who was a world expert at that time in C2 domains. Uh, Rob Stalin, anybody know Rob Stalin? If you do, make sure I let him know, people know he had hair at one time. So, you know, make sure he knew that so he feels better about himself. Uh, Longtime collaborator here, he's now at Purdue University. Uh, been independent for a while now and a full professor. So at this time, he was just a postdoc, and I went to these two, and I said, I need your help. How can we assay this? Will you look to see the interaction, the specific interaction of the lipids with the C2 domain? Preeti in my lab, we're going to do it the old way enzymatically and take a look at it, and she's the one who did the, the work I'm going to show you here. Here's where she's smiling because she got her American Heart Fellowship here on this day. That's the only time I actually saw her smile the entire time in the laboratory. All right, so this is a busy slide as well, and I'll just kind of run through it really quick. So, uh, over here is surface plasmon resonance. So you essentially take vesicles, you put them across a chip, you put the chip in, protein gets through the flow, and you're able to get very good, strong dissociation, association constant using the technology. That's what Juan Wa Cho does, that's what Rob Stalin does, and they do it very well. Over here is the poor man's. I didn't have a BioCore instrument where I was at at the time. We have a nice core there now but didn't have one at the time. And so this is surface dilution kinetics. And depending on how you set up the mixed micelle assay, you can either look at your michaelis menten kinetics once it's bound to the membrane, or you can actually look at the ability of the enzyme to actually bind and how long it's staying on the membrane and coming off. And using the two, kind of long story short, using the two different technologies, completely blind as to who was getting what when we came together, they showed that when you put ceramide 1-phosphate in, you had a 78% reduction in dissociation of the enzyme from the membranes. Uh, we found a 79% uh, reduction in the same thing using surface dilution kinetics. So you get this robust increase in enzyme activity, and that's all linked to how long the enzyme is staying on the membrane and be able to cleave its substrate. And so the analogy for the function of that would be is think of a boat. The way uh, translocation works, 
In 90% of the cases, translocation is about a protein that's always bouncing into membranes and something comes up that it sticks to. So it's not like a flag signals. Something just actually comes up that it sticks to and then when it hits, it sticks and it stays there longer and it looks like translocation, but it's really just sticking longer at that point. You have less dissociation from the membrane. And so think of it like a boat that's always, a, you know, someone like me piloting a boat. I'm always running into sandbars or something like that at that point or the beach. And then something comes up and I get anchored to it at that point and then it allows me to then cleave a lot of substrate and stay on the membrane longer. So that's really the function of how we look at ceramide 1-phosphate at this time. <coughs> and then over time, so here's Rob, you know, you know, but he did have hair at one time. He did. He did. I can't really, you know, he picks on me because look at the forehead at this point. So soon he'll be showing pictures and putting names on and I should probably get money essentially by, you know, Avanti Polar Lipids or something on my forehead. It's like a billboard. But I went to these guys and we're working with them over years. A long story short, we were able to find the ceramide 1-phosphate binding site. Uh, initially, we found these three amino acids, and then later on, with a collaboration with Rob, when he was independent, we actually showed that the RH here, so it's R61 and H62. This is 57, 58, and 59 in the C2 domain actually bind uh, ceramide 1-phosphate. And then, dating myself in me more, anybody know where this comes from? $64,000 question, $64,000 pyramid. Yeah, even I was a kid watching that. I just happened to see the reruns. So. It uh, goes back a long way. So after we knew the binding site, we could ask the question, does it have any role in the function of CPLA2-alpha in cells? We kind of did a nifty experiment before the CRISPR-Cas9. We can now just put this mutation in the cells if we wanted to. But back in the day, we had a nifty thing where we would just double label. We would put a CFP on the wild type. We put a YFP on the mutant. Uh, we take these viruses, we'd infect at the same time, we would wait, we would ask, add agonist, and then we would examine translocation by confocal microscopy. Um, I don't like microscopy in general for a, an assay, so I like to do things blind. And so I have an RNA splicing component, people that don't really even care about lipids in the same lab uh, in many ways. And so we can script them. We say, this is translocation, this is not translocation, and we have them score it blind. Uh, and so here microscopy though, this I kind of believe when I saw it because uh, here's the YFP, these cells are all labeled with both the, they both have transfected in the, uh, the mutant uh, and the wild type. We hit them with a very strong potent translocation, in this case calcium ionophore. You can see that the mutant is not even translocating at all in the same cell, yet we have very distinct Golgi perinuclear translocation for the wild type in the same cell. If we just look at all of the cells, uh, our scores were doing pretty well because you should see about 50% translocation of all cells with this agonist in five minutes. Uh, and, but when they did it, we found we didn't really have any statistically significant increase in translocation uh, in the mutant. So really suggesting that you need that interaction for the enzyme to translocate and to set off a cosinoid synthesis in the cells. And so conclusions, is that about seven years or so, but about 10 years in, we, we essentially said that ceramide 1-phosphate is a potent uh, and endogenous inducer of arachidonic acid release and a cosinoid biosynthesis. It does this by directly binding and activating CPLA2-alpha, which is the initial rate-limiting step. <clears throat> and it mediates this through activation, the activation via its association with the C2 domain, doing, needing 57, 58, 59, and now also 61 and 62. At this point, we had a very strong hypothesis that um, ceramide 1-phosphate is required for CPLA2-alpha function and a cosinoid synthesis, absolutely required. With all the tools that we had at that point, we were saying this is a missing link this is absolutely required, and you probably shouldn't live in absolutes, and I'll show you why you shouldn't live in absolutes, but it was nice to, to kind of say it at the time, all right? All right, so now we'll go into the unpublished findings of wound healing, and so we're changing gears just very quickly, but keep all that in mind, you know, ceramide 1-phosphate, just keep it in mind for five minutes, and I'll change the gears, and we'll talk about wound healing. <coughs> I assume with Jeff, you guys are pretty solid with wound healing, probably more than me since it's new for my lab. Good wound healers here? Wound healer? Wound healing? A major wound healing person uh, moved <laughs> a year and a half ago. All right, good. I can tell you anything at this point. We're good. All right. <laughs> I like it. All right, so why do we study wound healing then? Shouldn't I let the guy go? <laughs> you want to know why? Because in Florida, you could walk down the road and get bitten in the head by a snake, have a really bad day. Uh, you could be a construction worker, a lot of buildings going up, scientific buildings, and you could hit by a two-by-four and that could be stuck in your head. Always a bad thing, right? 
Of course, pressure ulcers, which is something we're, we're getting into and working with, with Jeff about, uh, they happen. $20 billion to the healthcare for he the wounds that we can't heal. It's a very difficult problem. We don't really understand why some wounds heal and one, why some don't. Uh, we have very little understanding of the biochemical mechanisms that are occurring, even the cell types, or whether there's subtypes to the cell types that are regulating this. So the wound healing, which I was shocked, is, is, is really there's a lot of unknowns in this area that we need to know, and it's extremely important from a healthcare uh, standpoint. Uh, why I got interested in this is that if you take all of the publications and all the literature out there over the last 30, 40 years, you find that over the different phases, so with wound healing, there are four distinct phases they like to break it into. Uh, hemostasis, so when you first get injured, you want to stop the bleeding. Inflammation, that essentially brings in the immune response. Immune cells come in, clean out the wound. You don't want to have the dead necrotic tissue. You don't want to have the bacteria. You need to clean it out. Then you need to proliferate, so the cells that you have there need to proliferate, so you have more of them, so you can actually fill in the wound. And these proliferated cells need to mature and then remodel in order to then complete the wound healing process. And with all the literature, you can see that there's a lot of different lipids that have been implicated in one aspect or the other. What I want to give you guys uh, to understand that many of these things, even though they're implicated here, and you think that these may be something that's really important, Many of these are monocentric studies and also had limited inhibitors, inhibitors that had specificity issues and these kind of things. So I'm kind of just taking the entirety of the literature and saying lipids are important probably for multiple phases of wound healing and maybe we, if we understand that process, we can take advantage of that to make you know, clinically relevant therapeutics or even take a multicentric temporal approach to treating wounds at different times in order to get better outcome. So that's kind of the goal as I looked at it. Uh, so lipids were important, so that was interesting. So this may be very interesting to look at in some of our models. And then why I went down the path of maybe ceramide 1-phosphate and CPLA2-alpha was a human study. Now I like to always say here, uh, not to pick on anyone, but there's certain IRB studies I will be involved with and certain IRB studies I will not be involved with. If, um, and, and I want to just state disclosure, I had nothing to do with this when I got the samples three years later. Okay. And I don't think I would have been involved in it, because essentially what they do here is we get volunteers to come in, not we, they. Um, they would pay them $200 to do this, on, and you would go in, and they'd had four of these eight centimeter PTFE tubes inserted into their arms. And then we would also do a wound, not we, I should say they, again, I was not involved. Uh, they would do a puncture, and that would be their time zero wound here, a puncture in their hip. And so you would pay them then, when they got their initial puncture, they got $50, and then they would get $50 each of the other days because you went in, and then they ripped out the tubes at that point because the, the cells would actually move into the PTFE tubes and you could look at wound healing that way. That was the goal of the study. So it's an admirable goal. I don't know whether that's the way to do it uh, at that point. Uh, to do surgical procedures on people who really don't need it. So I don't know, but the samples were there. Might as well take a look at it. So Bob comes in here, and I'll give him credit. He was part of this study. He took one for the team. He's allowed me to say that this is his arm here. He actually took one for the team, and he was one of the, the, the patients in the study. So uh, in this case, we took the, got a section of the tube, and we can then look over the wound healing process over days whether there's any change in our bioactive lipid mediators. And in this case with ceramide 1-phosphate, I was actually shocked. We normally don't see a lot of changes in that outside of cells with inflammatory agonists. We had a robust increase in ceramide 1-phosphate as we head toward the peak of the inflammatory stage. And then as you get into proliferation and remodeling, you start seeing ceramide 1-phosphate go down. So you actually have this temporal regulation of a very important bioactive lipid for my laboratory. So that coupled to the fact that many eicosanoids have already been linked to the wound healing process, it made sense that this may be something that we want to look at in the laboratory for our interaction. So that's how we got there. And so to look at the interaction, though, if you want to start looking at wound healing, uh, you know, I guess maybe we can IRB through a mutated human at this point if you can get through that last IRB, which I'm not understanding how that even got through the IRB. But you can definitely make a mouse. And in this case, I went to Jolene Wendell and Shirley Taylor. She ran the molecular core. Jolene Wendell uh, ran the transgenic core. And they helped me in making a uh, knock-in mouse. And so this is a gene that we put in, in the same place under the same promoter, and we put the mutations in 
uh, for our C1P binding site. At the time, we only knew about these three amino acids, so that's the three we converted to uh, three alanines that we knew had no effect on the basal activity of the enzyme or the, the normal function of the enzyme outside of binding the ceramide one phosphate. And so at the same time, we also make a knockout mouse and you also get wild type mouse. So the mice I'm going to show you are all homozygous and they were all created at the same time in, in separate colonies in the wild type. And we tried to keep them in the same genetic background as we go forward. Okay. And so, just to reiterate, we're going to have a knock-in mouse. This mouse will not respond, this enzyme should not respond to ceramide 1-phosphate in the cells like we showed before. We'll have a full ablation so we can compare the two. And the idea, so I want to stop here for a second. The idea at this point, we thought, remember, that ceramide 1-phosphate was absolutely required for the function of the enzyme. Therefore, our expectation was, our hypothesis, was that the knock-in would behave just like the knockout or the full ablation. That's why we compared the two we should get the same phenotypes uh, in those cases. And so the first thing we did is I had a graduate student who was very interested in wound healing. He did some work in an undergrad in kind of some wound healing. He was very interested in doing that in immune responses. And he said, I want this project. And I said, OK. And he also doesn't mind working with animals. He's actually extremely good at working with animals, shockingly enough. And um, so we do this uh, six millimeter excisional wound healing model for acute wounds. We try to stint them out as best we can because uh, mice heal a little bit differently than humans and the fact they have con skin contraction part of that where humans do not have as much as, as mice do. So by stinting it out, we try to mimic more of the human. It's not the best way of doing it. And we didn't see any difference whether we stinted it or not. And you're going to say, why am I doing this talk? I can end the talk here because we don't see any effect on closure rate. All right? and Probably those who aren't working in wound healing, and I wasn't really at the time, would probably say the same thing. Let's just move on and look at other phenotypes and forget about it because we're not getting any differences in the knockout. We're not getting any difference in the knock-in for a comparison and then the wild type. So no difference on closure rate over time. But as I was telling Jeff, I abuse graduate students as much as I can. What I mean by abuse is if it's not much of your time and we should check and you just never know, let's do it. Just do one more small check. I told Patrick, I said, yeah, cleave through the wound and let's take a look at the wound. Because again, mice do heal differently and wound closure rate is not that important when it comes to mice wound healing. So why don't we take a look at the wound itself? Just do one more little thing. And that's why we have the talk here. And the reason why I sent him down that, that path is that wounds can heal differently. You can have, so okay, some poor person for whatever reason gets tired, falls asleep, barrels through your fence, okay? Or in my case, you have a grad student that you had a party at your house and took out your fence. One of the two happens at that point. So if I then go and fix my fence, it's going to look like this. Okay? You can see the gaps and things like that. I'm not really all that handy when it comes to fixing fences and things like that. So that's a problem. So wounds can heal poorly or they can heal really well at this point, and so I can actually call out a contractor and pay a lot of money to have this, or we can have a Y2K guy who really goes over the top at that point to heal the wound. But for the most part, healed wounds only heal back over a year to about 80 to 90 percent of what they originally were. But they can also really heal very poorly as well. So I said, let's take a look and see how the wound is healing, is essentially was the goal. And so we actually had a very striking phenotype when we first looked at the wound. Uh, here's the wild type, here's the knockout, and here's the knock-in. We saw all the time a tremendous increase in the number of cells actually in the wound. It was a striking phenotype and then you just start asking the next question. What are the cells that are there and why are they there? And then more importantly with our hypothesis, why is the knockout and the knock-in showing something different? Clearly at that point we had to actually even start looking at our hypothesis again and started modifying our hypothesis. And when I was with students and postdocs, Science is always about modifying your hypothesis and being flexible. And so we have to come to the conclusion here that even just with this one piece of data, that the interaction of C1P with the enzyme may be important for only specific functions. All right, so here's graphically representation. just want to point that out. Significant increases in the cell number in the wound every single time we looked at the wound. Then what are the cell types? So because of the time frame, this is a, a heal right at the healing time, about 10 to 14 days in, very likely it was fibroblasts or keratinocytes along those lines. And there may be keratinocytes in there as well. But we can definitely stain for fibroblasts. We can use heat shock protein 47. 
or a fibroblast activated protein. And in each case, we saw tremendous increases here. You can only see even the brown. The only thing we're seeing brown here is in the knock-in. So we definitely have increases in dermal fibroblast migration into the wound. Then the question comes in, okay, we have increases in dermal fibroblasts. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? With wound healing, fibroblasts, if they come in and they're not very organized and are there, it can actually be a bad thing and lead to scarring. Uh, but most of the time it can be a very good thing if they're organized and they're depositing collagen type 1 versus collagen type 3. What we have here on the left panel is uh, picrocerius red. If you look under polarized uh, light, uh, collagen type 1 will be a very dark red, and collagen type 3, which is more associated with scarring, will be yellow. So what's a good thing in wound healing is usually having more collagen type 1. And what we can see is we don't see very much yellow at all here. And then more importantly, then come back and stain for type 1 collagen when you see this kind of effect. And you can see we have a tremendous increase in type 1 collagen that's being deposited, really suggesting a mature, stronger wound may be occurring by having this increase in fibroblast uh, migration. And here's a graphical representation looking very much like the number of cells that are coming in. We see that increase in collagen type 1. Then on the EM level, you can take a look, and this is what sold me. All the other stuff, you say, okay, it's interesting. Yes, we have more collagen type 1. But what is it actually looking, at, looking like? And when you look at uh, transmission electron microscopy, you can look at the collagen fibrils themselves, and you can see here's the wild type, and here's the knockout at the same time, same wound, about 10, 14 days or so. And if you look at the knock-in animal, again, remember, this just simply has the mutation in the C1P binding site for this one enzyme. You see tightly packed collagen fibers. You can actually get a complete shift in diameter. So they're more tightly packed and they're smaller, more, again, more indicative of a mature, faster heal wound. And then if we look at tensile strength, this is a very interesting assay. Has anyone done one of these assays at all? This is about as medieval as you get. So they, we essentially make a, just a, unlike the puncture wounds, all the other ones are puncture wounds. In this case, what we do is we just make a cut, uh, a slice like this. We let it heal for 14 days, and then around that cut, we then take a bow tie piece of skin, okay? The animal sacrifice at this point, it's not alive, so we take the skin. You take the skin and you put it in this medieval looking contraption. We go over to engineers, and you know, they're still in the dark ages for some things. Not all Star Trek over there. And they then pull the skin, and you get a reading on how much force it takes to actually break that skin at that point. If you were to put normal skin on there, it won't break. It'll just keep stretching at this point. But wounded skin, you can go, and it will then eventually break. And we find that the wild type and the knockout, there was really no significant difference in wound tensile strength, but we had a tremendous increase in tensile strength with the knock-in. We even had some knock-in skins that we didn't include in this because we didn't know how to calculate it that never broke at all. They just kept stretching like the, the normal skin. So we had a really, so everything is lining up that by having this mutation that we put in, you're getting a much faster and stronger wound actually occurring uh, in the animals. And so uh, at this point, we simply wanted to say, what happens? Why is this occurring? Can we simplify and start thinking mechanistically? How is this mutation then, which we thought would just shut down a cosinoid synthesis like the knockout, but clearly they don't have the same phenotype. What is it actually doing? And so we went, instead of trying to look at whole tissue, we started then pulling out the different cell types, primary cells, and see if we couldn't recapitulate some of the things that we're seeing there, and then trying to figure out what the mechanism that's occurring. So in the last part of the talk here, that's what I'm gonna kind of talk about. And so one of the things you can easily get from the animals are dermal fibroblasts. We got uh, uh, Patrick here doing again many of these things. He's now Dr. McKnight, because he got his PhD on this work. And we were able to pull out the different dermal fibroblasts. Here showing another, just a, a completely different one, a number of cells here. And then we can look at their migration over time under the microscope after mechanical trauma. And we found that we had a, a very nice increase in the migration velocity of the KI fibroblasts. This did not correlate with meandering problems. So again, when I told you before with fibroblasts, that they come in disorganized and they jump around, you want to make sure that you're not having an effect on meandering, that they're moving more in a polarized way in a straight line so they can deposit the collagen correctly and actually heal the wound and stuff. So we didn't see any effects there, which was good. So they're all migrating the same way in the same kind of straight line. And at the same time, you had a much faster migration velocity in the uh, knock-in 
uh, fibroblasts. And then if we go and we take ceramide kinase inhibitors, so we've kind of gone past this a little bit, and I wanted to make sure from a clinical standpoint, was there some kind of drug that we could use to also mimic this? There are ceramide kinase inhibitors that are available. We then treat them so we don't have the mutation anymore. We're actually taking out ceramide 1-phosphate from the cells so it can't bind the enzyme. So hopefully we'll get the same effect by doing it a different way. We take ceramide kinase inhibitors. We have compound 1, 2, and the Novartis 231 compound. And each one of the inhibitors, every single time we do it, also increases the migration velocity of the dermal fibroblasts as well. So two different ways of modifying how C1P can affect this enzyme, and we get the same phenotype. Then we go to lipidomics. I always like to plug Charlie here because he's really the guy who, who did a lot of the pro-resolution uh, lipids. But you can see that the pathway I showed you, which was just this one, is just one pathway to look at when it comes to eicosanoids. That's just the prostaglandins. <clears throat> there are a number of pro-resolution type ones coming off of EPA and DHA. There's the lipoxygenase pathway that we know very little about because many of these, these, these guys we couldn't even assay until about five, six, seven years ago uh, maximum. We still do not have assays for many of their metabolites as well, and it's, so it's a completely untapped open area uh, at that point, which I'm excited about because when I show you the data here, we're kind of go, going into these pathways and doing something new. Okay, And so long story short, when we looked at the lipidomics, so we do lipidomics, so we talked about Bob Murphy being here before, he's one of the pioneers. Uh, we work off many of the things that he did, and we have very nice quantitative assays for eicosanoids and sphingolipids now based on much about his work that he does. And so what we, find, what we found when we looked at the amount of uh, eicosanoids, these are the ones that we picked up, and we kind of give a heat map here. You can see that the knockout has many of these down, just like were reported in the literature for the knockout. What was incredible to us, because if you think back to our hypothesis, is that, yes, we had some that gave the same phenotype, PG2, just like we happened to choose before when we made that really absolute hypothesis. You see that's also down in the knock-in. But it also looked like we had increases. So this interaction with C1P seems to be important for the production of certain eicosanoids, and it's also inhibitory to the production of other eicosanoids. So it may direct the enzyme to make certain types with certain agonists, and when C1P is not around, it may actually move and actually generate other ones. And in this case, we found tremendous increases in the heat pathway at this point. No real effects on morphology of the dermal fibroblasts, but we always saw, depending on, regardless of genetic background, we saw decreases in PGE2, the pro-inflammatory, and increases in the heat pathway. And we went ahead and we tested all of the ones that were up. We put them on the dermal fibroblast, but the only one that we actually found uh, to do anything was 5-heat. Five 5-heat five tremendously increased, was tremendously increased both in vitro and in vivo. Uh, we were able to recapitulate that with the ceramide kinase inhibitors as well, like we showed you. So we were able to do the migration phenotype as well as that. And then here, finally, sorry I got ahead of myself, uh, we go back and we recapitulate in vitro. We're able to take the wild type and add 5-heat. If you add PG2, it's a well-known inhibitor of fibroblast migration. That's exactly what it does. And so in the knock-in animal, you almost get the perfect storm. You get a decrease in PG2, an increase in 5-heat, and we see increases in dermal fibroblast migration, both in the wounds and in vitro. And if we take the knockout animal, it's very sensitive then for very low levels of 5 heat to drive the migration phenotype as well. So the knockouts are also losing that PG2, so they respond at about four-fold four, four lower dose than the wild types do for driving the migration phenotype. And then just to make sure of a few things, we want to make sure that we're not getting some kind of adaptation going on by mutating the CPLA2-alpha. Are we somehow getting an increase in some other PLA2 that may be overcompensating and giving us what we're doing? We want to, want to test that. And we also want to make sure then it looks like five heat, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. Let's make sure it's a duck. And let's take out the five heat biosynthetic pathway with a 5-LO inhibitor. That's one of the enzymes that helps make five heat and see if we block the effect. And this is a bit busy, walk through it very quickly. If we sit here, pyrophenone, this is the CPLA2-alpha inhibitor that's fairly specific. If you take the knock-ins and you treat it with that, you have a distinct inhibition of the migration velocity. So this is due to the mutant enzyme, 
It's not due to some kind of upregulation of another PLA2 because this is specific for CPLA2 alpha. Uh, and it has no effect then on the wild type and the knockout like expected. Then we take the MKA86. This is the flap inhibitor. This will then also gives the same block and has no effect on the wild type or the knockout, only the effect on the knock-in. And then the piece de resistance, you do this, you knock down the knock-in, but you add back five heat and you're able to bring it back to the same micro migration velocity and, over co and compensate for those inhibitors as well. So, and just to, to shoot the horse now, we've, we've beat the horse, kicked the horse, now we're gonna shoot the horse and make sure it's dead. We come back with our viral recapitulation that we love to do, that assay. We can put back then the wild type and the mutant virus back into the knockout fibroblasts at this point and see if we can recapitulate then the phenotype in the knock-in versus the wild type. And if we do that, we get those wonderful increases in five heat. We get a significant increase in the migration velocity when we put back in the virus. So recapitulate five heat and recapitulate the migration velocity as well in the knockouts. So indeed, we do believe it's due to the mutation and it's causing a switch over to making the heats and that's what's causing the enhanced uh, migration. And so conclusions and future directions before I go into to the uh, switching function hypothesis for the last couple minutes. Phenotype, the losses interaction in mice leads to enhanced fibroblast migration and tissue regeneration. Lipidomics, by using lipidomics, we're able to link that to a decrease in those pro-inflammatory mediators like the knockout, but at the same time, you get an increase in these chemotactic ones, the heats. Cell biology, inhibition of 5-LO will block this enhanced migration as well. Uh, and, I mean, blocks the enhanced migration, linking it to 5-heat, as well as we could recapitulate. Human translation, going back to why we looked at this, we did find C1P levels are increased during the inflammatory stage of wound healing. It would be very nice if we still had those samples. There was a freezer accident, unfortunately. It would be very nice if we could go back and look at 5-heat or some of its metabolites to do that. Unfortunately, we can't, and I refuse to try to put in that IRB to do it again. Let's just do one heinous act and not do it again at this point. Uh, and so the future, we want to know whether or not we can translate this to other wounds like chronic wounds. What I showed you is an acute wound model. Can we do some human translation at this point? Uh, things that just get wound fluid, things are non-invasive with actual patients with chronic wounds. Mechanistic studies on how this class switch is going and our other phases of wound healing. So we just looked at the late phase, the proliferation stage and the remodeling. Are we having effects on early phase, like the inflammatory stage as well? Are we reducing that? So that's a lot of our future studies are looking at that. And to give you an idea where we're at in that area, what's going on, this is not projecting well, I, I apologize. But we started looking to see CPLA2 alpha. As we said, C1P tends to modify where it goes in the cell. And we found in the knock-in cells that it was uh, located differently. You can kind of see that there's distinct differences, the wild type here, and then without, uh, with the mutation, you can see how it's more dispersed in the cell versus being more perinuclear and Golgi. So it's, it's doing okay on the projection. So distinctly different localization that's occurring, more vesicular and cytoplasmic, which we know little understanding of. In fact, the entire field, we know very little about how the enzyme, where else it goes besides the Golgi and these other vesicles. And so that's something we'll be taking a look at. FLAP was very unique. Uh, we, FLAP is known to be perinuclear and nuclear that you can see in the wild type cells. We actually found FLAP. So this is 5-LO activating protein. I probably didn't explain that very well. It's absolutely required for 5-LO activity, which is the initial uh, biosynthetic enzyme for those heats that we're talking about. And in this case, we find it actually out of the nucleus and in the cytoplasm in the knock-in. There's nothing known about translocation of this enzyme away from the nucleus in any way, shape, or form. And so that's something that we're trying to figure out how. There's nothing known about its regulation or why it would even do that uh, in the presence of a mutant, simply a mutant CPLA2 alpha. And here it's just showing recapitulation. So again, microscopy is one way to look at it. Why don't we do some biochemistry and fractionate it? And with FLAP, you can see that it's completely different with the nuclear and the cytoplasmic location. So here in the knock-in, out of the nucleus and more cytoplasm. <coughs> so this is just a confirmation slide. So at this point, we have the enzyme localized differently. We have the enzyme is now co-localized with FLAP, that activator of 5-LO. We have little understanding of why that is. And going back and looking at it, this is where I told you I may come back to this if I have time, and I got a couple minutes here. 
Uh, PIP2 binding to the catalytic domain, this is another lipid activator. I'm not going to go into phosphonosatide biology very much, just think of it as another lipid activator of the enzyme. Uh, maybe when C1P is not present, we switch over here because we have very little understanding of the agonist in the cell context of where C1P is important now, because it's clearly not an absolute requirement uh, for activity. And PIP2, what are the roles of that? Or in the same cell type with the same agonist, do you have temporal regulation of interplay between the lipids? And a couple pieces of quick data to suggest we may have an antagonistic role is that here going back to our mixed micelle assay, and this is what another one of my students is finishing up for his PhD, we have C1P gives a very robust activation. PIP2 even gives a stronger activation of the enzyme and the mixed myel assay, mixed micelle assay. But when you mix the two, C1P actually starts competing and lowering the PIP2. And so this is just one smattering data. We've gone on to this and shown that they're very antagonistic for their binding, and C1P will usually outcompete and has a higher affinity for the enzyme. So when C1P is around, the enzyme should go there, and when it's not, it will then be free to switch over to PIP2 and be activated by that. And PIP2 is well known to be in these cytoplasmic vesicles. And so we think that C1P may be actually shifting over. And we think this may actually be important for how the cell responds to inflammatory agonists over time. Because lipidomics is relatively new and it's very expensive to set up and to look at all these eicosanoids, if you look in the literature, you'll see very little that you can find on temporal production of different eicosanoid species. And what we're finding is that there actually may be temporal induction with the same inflammatory agonist. In this case, these are just HUVEX cells that we hit with TNF-alpha because we're doing a lot of transendothelial migration assays now for neutrophils. And we find that hitting them with TNF-alpha, you get a really rapid spike in PGE2 that goes up and then comes down. At the same time, five heat levels, basal levels go down and then start coming back up when PGE2 uh, is going down. And if you look at C1P levels at the same time, they go up to correspond to this maximal increase in PGE2. When they go down, we start seeing five heat actually coming back. So we actually think that there may be temporal regulation with different agonists. Now that we have the lipidomics technology that's reproducible, works very well, and the setup, we may be able to go back and look at these things that we couldn't look at 10 years ago uh, at this point. And so I find that to be kind of exciting and really means the same cell type will respond to agonists over time to produce different eicosanoids to have different outcomes as we go through. So uh, this is our current hypothesis again. With mechanical trauma, CPLA2-alpha will bind C1P, will make those in pro-inflammatory eicosanoids. If you don't have that, you'll get a really rapid switch to PIP2. PIP2 then will make more of these anti-inflammatory or the heats, which will drive the migration, the maturation of the fibroblasts, and so we think that's one of the reasons why we're getting this, this rapid increase. Anyway, that's the mechanism that we're going. And I'm a couple minutes late, apologize for that. Got a little talkative and wordy. Here's my lab, these are the people that do it. I haven't been in the wet lab in 17 years, so clearly I'm not doing these experiments. I get to sit back and look at fun data they generate every day. So it's a great, it's a great life being a, a principal investigator of a laboratory. And we can't do this without the funding that NIH and the VA has provided, which has been very nice. I'm also very collaborative. There's no way I could have done this without the, the many collaborators uh, over the years uh, for this work. Many of these people, Rob Stalin, my, with the transporter, we got Ted, Rick, and Din Shaw here. Charlie's been supportive and was the initial one doing some lipidomics before we had to set up. Juan Wa Cho making my mouse. Jason Carlin and I working on ceramide kinase now and Golgi fragmentation. Margaret Park, longtime assistant professor, and of course Bob Deagleman, you know, doing the archaic IRB. The samples at least sent us down this path. I'm going to look at the good here. And now Jeff, who sent us some chronic wound fluids as well, which are really intriguing when it comes to 5 heat. So we may be on to something here. And maybe we can go back and look at the metabolites, because it turns out that 5 heats have metabolites that are much more potent. And when we got into the genetic backgrounds, we weren't seeing the 5 heat increases. And when we added on the other ones, it was because it was getting converted over to metabolites very quickly. So the more and more capabilities you get, the more questions we can answer. And so I'll leave it there, and thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions? So, well, not, they had a gain-of-function phenotype, I guess. Yes, I was extremely surprised. 
And it's a great question. So the knockout animal has about 20 to 25 phenotypes that are ascribed to it. The knockout animal shares some of the phenotypes because you can see some of, the, some of those eicosanoids do require C1P to be produced. One of those is response to anaphylaxis, systemic anaphylaxis, passive systemic anaphylaxis. The knock-in and knock-out were both resistant to those the same way. But we had accentuated phenotypes in the knock-in. The wound healing phenotype, sepsis. The knockout either is no different than a wild type, depending on the sepsis context, or is more sensitive to uh, sepsis. The knock-in is resistant. So we had a kind of a different one. And then we have, so we have shared, and then we have some of them that the knock-in didn't have that the knockout's been. So the knockout has a spontaneous abortion phenotype, the knock-in does not. It has a different kind of phenotype when it comes to, which we don't quite understand. It's either gonna be that we've somehow created a preterm birth, one, we get the same number of pups but they're dead, or we have a lactation issue in the animal. So it's weird. So we get some that are completely different, some are the same. Did you see anything with uh, adaptive We may have those. That's a great question. We have not looked. Uh, I've had discussions. Uh, obviously, you're keying into the same thing. Some of these phenotypes that we're seeing could be linked to exactly that. And so we've kind of opened some collaborations at this point to see if we have differences in our T and B cell populations at that point. It is a distinct po possibility. Other questions? So, uh, first of all, Really nice lecture, and I, I like how you put both the clinical and the basic science together. Um, so whenever I think about CPLA2, I I think of glycosinoids, but of course I think of platelet activated factor, lipids. What is known um, in your models? Because we actually did some wounding on half receptor knockout mice, very primitive studies, didn't see a difference, and then we walked on. Uh, okay, I have not looked, and I don't think it's, it's not included in our analysis package, and it's a good idea probably to put it in. I was actually thinking that when you brought it up when we were driving, and you brought it, and I was like, oh, I should have had that in the pack a long time ago. So we have not looked. I do believe that the knockout has some kind of um, phenotype related to that. I'd have to go back and look. Yeah, it's a coagulation phenotype. So it does have one, that's why originally, so when I talked about the sepsis model, some of them, it behaves the same, but if you look early in a sepsis model, the knockout has better uh, outcome, but then it crashes worse <laughs> later. That's why all the inhibitors for CPLA2-alpha actually failed in the clinic. They, they used it for years, millions went into R&D for CPLA2-alpha inhibitors, but they ultimately failed, I think, because it has not only pro-inflammatory, but pro-resolution functions. So where something initially gets better, then it actually gets worse. So when it comes to platelet, I believe they have a coagulation that's linked to that. Uh, but it's hard to, to verse versus that versus some of the other cosinoids that also could be regulating the coagulation. I don't think they actually tried to rescue the, yeah. the phenotype. And, and I think your temporal study is showing that PG2 first and then P later, I mean, it goes to show you that you just can't think of it in terms of one molecule, one inhibitor. Eventually, I would see different strategies. So right after a wound, you use this, and for more immediate times, you use another inhibitor. Or exactly. So that's what I'm trying from even a clinical standpoint, and and what I have problems with the, the sepsis clinical trials, and think about wound healing. I think you really need to take. It's important to try to stage where they're at, where things are stalled, like wound healing, where it's stalled, where a sepsis patient is at. Um, are they in the hyperinflammatory phase versus the immunosuppressive phase? And you need to take kind of a comprehensive mono, a, a multicentric approach and temporal approach to how you treat them. I think many of the clinical trials failed for some of going after some of the eicosanoids, depending on where they treated the patient in some of these. So I think you're absolutely correct. And we didn't even, I, I, no one, I was asking my friend Rob, who's also in the CPLA2 outfield, I said, I've never heard of anyone looking at it temporally thinking that anything was actually made over time in the same cell with the same agonist. It was always, this agonist makes this a cosinoid or this, this, like, no one's ever even looked at it. We completely overlooked at it. It's like we've had tunnel vision for 25 years. Sir. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing. Very interesting data. Um, I wonder, did you look into the extracellular matrix and what could be these models in a setting of diabetes? 
because this is where the world really is a big problem. So yeah. If this mice with SDZ or cross the Okay. We haven't looked at the extracellular matrix except for deposition of collagen at this point. So that's not a bad suggestion to look at. And I cannot say there are a number of areas outside of wound healing where cosinoids will regulate extra, the extracellular matrix in a number of ways. Sepsis being one of those uh, as well as to how the neutrophils and the rolling in the, the endothelial cells. So I agree that's a very good place to look. Haven't done that yet. Diabetes. I don't know. That is an outstanding question as well. So our research study that we propose that we have a grant in to do, we are not dispelling diabetes patients in our pressure ulcers in our ulcer study as a covariable. In fact, we want it as a covariable. And so we can then look at, in a subset, if we get enough patients, and I think we will for what we're getting, we may be able to look at both their wounds to see if there's a difference and look to see even if it's indicated in the plasma as to what the outcome is gonna be. I don't know, that we're, gonna, we're asking that question as we go through. And you're right, it, it's, a, it's a huge problem in healthcare as far as the ulcers that are formed in diabetic patients. And so we're, we're on it, we're looking at it, and it would be interesting to look at. Theoretically, I hadn't thought about it from an animal perspective. So it's not like we couldn't probably cross it with things and take a look at those models, if, but depending on how indicative those are of those. So it's, it's, it's another very good question. We are looking at it. Uh, most of the data I have at this point has to do with more type 1 diabetic patients and beta cell destruction uh, in juveniles. And so that's kind of a different context, and I don't know how much it applies particularly here. Sorry, I wish I had the data yet, but they've got to give me the money first. They're expensive. All right. Um, if there's no other questions, uh, Dr. Chalfant, we got you a little something from our department. All so right. This is our. Standard. How'd you know I love t-shirts? Yeah. So it's uh. pharmacology and toxicology, advancing research from molecule to man, and I think your your talk actually exemplifies that. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get there. Yeah. Maybe your neosporin will now have ceramides kinase inhibitors in it. We'll, we'll see. Are we ready? Take oh. a picture. Oh. Okay. Photo op. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.